When we can bring down uh, the cost to access orbit to such an extent as Starship is, is endeavoring to do, you don't even know potentially the possibilities. Are we gonna have space hotels? I don't know, maybe at some point in time, but we're gonna be able to put a lot more stuff up there. There's a lot of space, we're gonna learn a lot, and there will certainly be an economy to follow. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. Uh, my name is Christian Davenport. I'm a reporter at The Post covering NASA and the space flight industry. And I am thrilled to be joined this morning by Jared Isaacman, the founder and CEO of Shiftboard Payments, uh, who is also an astronaut who flew last year in a SpaceX capsule uh, in orbit, uh, circling the Earth three times in what was the first all private astronaut mission to space. Since then, he has commissioned three more flights from SpaceX and is going back in what he calls the Polaris program, which seeks to open up a new frontier in commercial space. Jared Isaacman, welcome. It's so great to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me, Christian. Sure thing. And thanks to our audience uh, for joining us. We want you to join the conversation as well. You can tweet your questions to us at Post Live, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. But in the meantime, Jared, I, I wanted to ask you, so you went to space last year for the uh, Inspiration4 mission. And frankly, I think we thought, you know, that was going to be it. It was going to be a one-off. I mean, how can you top that? And it was a big surprise and a lot of news when you decided like, hey, that you were going to go back to space with Polaris. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how this upcoming mission, the first of these uh, Polaris missions, which is going to launch in March, is different from what you did last year. Uh, sure, really good question. So um, I, I didn't think I was going back either. Uh, so in Inspiration4, um, I think we we accomplished every objective we set out to achieve. Uh, that mission in itself, um, you know, our, our goal was was to show it could be done. Uh, show it could be done. Uh, send, you know, the first time you're sending non-government astronauts up into orbit, we were in orbit for three days. Um, try and maximize our time in orbit, get a lot of science and research done. We went uh, farther than the International Space Station, farther into space than Hubble. Uh, so kind of a milestone towards where we all want to go someday, which is back to the moon and Mars. Um, number of first, first uh, black female pilot of a spacecraft, youngest American to go into orbit with Haley Arsenault, um, first pediatric cancer survivor to go into space with a prosthesis as well. Uh, and we raised over $250 million for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, showing, um, you know, we can work really hard to, to build the exciting world we want to live in for tomorrow without ignoring the responsibilities of today. And, and mostly really just if we get this right, uh, imagine all the exciting missions to follow. Um, and we did get it all right. And, and now Polaris is here. And this is an example of all those exciting missions to follow. So the Polaris program picks up where we left off with Inspiration4. We're, we're still raising a lot of money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. We got $250 million before. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, big believers in, in the St. Jude vision that no child should die in the dawn of life. So we will continue to raise funds and awareness for St. Jude throughout the Polaris program. But we're also on to those exciting missions to follow, which with Polaris is a series of tech demonstration missions. It's doing things that either have never been done before uh, or haven't been done in over 50 years. And the idea is to build upon these things uh, so we continue to open up space for others. Um, to get back to the moon and get to Mars and beyond. So Polaris Dawn, which, will launch, which is set to launch now, um, no earlier than March 1st, uh, will go set a new uh, Earth orbit altitude record, so over 1,400 kilometers. That was last uh, established by the Gemini 11 mission. Uh, in doing so, we're at that altitude, we're going to get exposed to the Van Allen radiation belt. Uh, that can inform vehicle design architecture um, so that you don't maybe necessarily need to harden the vehicle as much for radiation. It's going to tell us a lot about human uh, physiology and exposure to, you know, with radiation exposure that we expect um, uh, will be common for long duration spaceflight missions. Uh, it'll inform about 40 different science and research experiments. We're going to do an EVA, that's a spacewalk. Um, so it's first commercial spacewalk, but I think what's most important is like it's a brand new EVA suit design and a new operations for, for conducting the spacewalk. Uh, when we get back to the moon and we get to Mars someday, uh, it won't be just uh, 
you know, two people at a time. We, you want you envision a, a potential colony on Mars at some point, uh, a permanent presence on the moon, in which case you need a lot of spacesuits and they can't cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, you need a mass produced, low cost EVA spacesuit so you can get outside the safety of a, a habitat and vehicle and, and do work, um, you know, on the surface of of that, that planet or celestial body or even in space on the way. So EVA is very important for us. And then the third objective is uh, we're gonna communicate over Starlink. Uh, so laser-based communication that will be imperative uh, for sending messages back home from, from Mars and it'll certainly be utilized uh, from the moon as well. And again, about 40, uh, 40 different science and research experiments during our five days on orbit. Yeah, and, and let's just note real quick, the Starlink is uh, SpaceX's um, internet um, satellite-based uh, communication system. Uh, and I know the science is big to you, uh, but when you go for this, I, these are really ambitious flights and it's a really ambitious program. Going to space, um, one of the things that I've noticed is how seriously you take that. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit of the training. I thankfully got a taste of that with you, uh, got to fly in the back of a MiG-29 fighter jet with you, but you, your training is really rigorous. And I wonder if you can walk us through how you prepare yourself and your crew to get ready for these missions. Well, you're, you're totally correct. We do take this very, very seriously. I mean, we're, we're working towards a world where you could potentially open up space for everyone. Um, the last of the Polaris missions, the third mission is Starship. And Starship could be the 737 for human spaceflight. Um, where you could potentially be taking 100 people per starship uh, up into orbit, whether it's for point-to-point -point travel or eventually Moon and Mars. And, and, and SpaceX isn't building one starship, they're going to build hundreds of starships. So um, everything you know, we accomplish right now ultimately de-risks that important evolution of human spaceflight. Uh, so that is why we want to push the boundaries now. We're not going to just go to the International Space Station uh, you know, forever. We're, we're opening up space with rapidly reusable uh, rocket technology um, that's going to be a, a, just a total game changer. So um, for us to learn things now that have been exclusive to kind of the government superpowers for a long time, like undertaking a spacewalk, um, like going farther than the International Space Station, will all inform future missions to come. And we got to get it right, because if we do get it wrong, this, this timeline gets reset in a big way. It was the same way for Inspiration4. If that went wrong, they'd say, we told you it shouldn't be done this way. Let's just keep it to government astronauts forever. Um, and it can't be like that. Space should be opened up for everyone. There's a lot to learn out there. There's a lot to accomplish. So just like with Inspiration4, we got to get it right with Polaris. Um, we really pulled together a, a heck of a crew to do it. But we are training a lot, to your point. Uh, so Inspiration4's training timeline was about six months. Uh, we're looking at probably eight to nine months with, with Polaris Dawn. So EVA training is a big part of it. So we're doing scuba diving. Uh, we have these suspension systems we're working with. Uh, we've, we fly fighter jets. That's what you were exposed to. That's a, a very fast uh, environment where things happen quickly. It's a dynamic environment. You got to make good decisions fast where there's consequences. And you don't have that um, when you're in a simulator. So um, it builds crew resource management, radio work. Uh, we can do a lot of operations that have parallels over to human spaceflight. And again, it's a, it's a high consequence environment. We do mountain climbing for team building. Um, you know, a lot of these things that we do draw upon, you know, 60 years of human spaceflight experience from NASA. And then we spend a lot of time in the classroom. We spend a lot of time in the simulator as well. Yeah, I mean, that, that was great uh, flying with you and, and following the program. And what strikes me is how you're, you know, building upon it, inspiration for leads to Polaris Dawn, you do the, the spacewalk. Uh, but we didn't know what the second flight and the Polaris program was going to be. And now we have an idea because NASA and SpaceX recently announced that they're going to study the feasibility of having a, a commercial uh, flight, a commercial crew boost the Hubble Space Telescope, take it to a higher orbit, and then potentially extend its life. And if that study says this is feasible, that would likely be uh, your second mission. I wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit. What's the significance of that and some of the logistical challenges that you'll have to overcome? Yeah, for sure. Uh, really exciting news this past week, for sure, with um, the press conference with uh, NASA, SpaceX, and, um, uh, and Polaris uh, talking about what could be, to your point, the select second Polaris mission. Um, now, the whole idea uh, when we announced Polaris Dawn as the first Polaris mission and then the third mission being uh, Starship was that second mission, we're going to learn a lot from now until then and, and, and build upon the first mission 
um, you know, which, which de-risks the third mission. So if you think about it, uh, we're doing an EVA on this mission that doesn't, on Polaris Dawn, that doesn't mean we'll do an EVA on, on, on Hubble, but if, but if that mission ultimately comes to be, then any experience you can gain prior to actually, um, you know, working on, on what is a, a national treasure and what maybe one of the most important scientific instruments of, of all time, um, is, is beneficial. Um, but we have been building in this direction. Uh, so you think about it, uh, Dragon as a, as a spacecraft and, and even shuttle before it, predominantly the missions over its, its latter portion of its life were just going to the space station. Inspiration4 went past the space station. It went past Hubble. So you unlocked some additional uh, performance capabilities or at least expanded the envelope of the vehicle. Now we're going to 1,400 kilometers. I mean, you're talking about nearly three times the altitude of the current Hubble spacecraft. So you know we have the ability um, through the performance of the vehicle to boost Hubble. And if we can do that and we can bring it up above the, the, the current Starlink constellation and maybe put some enhancements along the way, then you're, you're talking about this great scientific instrument, this explorer that helps us look back into the, the history of the universe. And now coupled with James Webb telescope uh, has even more to offer science. And if we can do that for 20 more years, that's a, that's a great gift to the scientific community all around the world. So. Um, it's just a study for now, uh, but you can certainly say that with the, the efforts we did with, with Inspiration4 and certainly with Polaris Dawn's objectives, it does set us up for the possibility of executing on that mission should the study support it. You know, and it was interesting, Jared, on Twitter the other day, somebody said something to the effect of, and of course, uh, on the Hubble Boost mission, there are going to be professional astronauts. Uh, accompanying you. And your response I thought was really interesting. You said maybe, maybe not, but that the focus should be on whether the commercial space sector can complete this mission and not on, you know, the color of the person's uniform completing it. I, I thought that was fascinating. And I wonder if you can elaborate on that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, I, I think in this is this has certainly been a different time in human spaceflight over the last couple of years, right? As you see commercial industry come about and you have, you know, organizations investing a lot of private funds into advancing human spaceflight technology that can serve a lot of other purposes too: cargo, payload, satellites, um, you know, ultimately trying to bring down the cost to access orbit for the benefit of everybody for a much more exciting future. And you have Blue Origin doing it and you have, um, you know, Virgin Galactic doing it. You have a number of companies. Firefly Aerospace just uh, achieved orbit a few days ago. This is awesome. This is such a great thing for, for keeping a competitive environment, which drives progress, brings down costs. Um, but in doing so, it creates a natural confusion of, you know, well, are the only people that are, that are going to be able to, to operate in space? Are they going to be the, you know, the, the blue suit astronauts from the right stuff? Um, and they're amazing. Uh, and, and we are truly standing on the shoulders of giants to get to this point. But it won't stay government astronauts forever. There's just too much space and too much accomplished out there. There's going to be commercial astronauts for a reason. It's, it's why there's even a designation for it. So in, in my opinion, you know, um, people that are drawing a little bit too much on the right stuff in the past are, are, are not really in the present right now. And, and the present is we potentially have the means available to us to save an important scientific instrument like Hubble, raise its altitude, enhance its capabilities to deliver science for decades in the future. Um, and it may come at little to no cost to the taxpayers, thanks to private space, commercial space funding. Um, that's all that should matter. Right now, I, I think it's it's kind of like a little bit too uh, in the weeds and missing the point to think through who is a more capable human being um, to be undertaking the mission. Um, is is the reward substantially outweigh the risk? And I certainly think so. And I also, you know, I don't mind any personal shots. I, I know I'm uh, I, I put myself out there and and it. Um, you know, it, it's it's part of the game. But, you know, I have an incredible crew, uh, you know, for the Polaris Dawn mission. I had an incredible crew for Inspiration4. Polaris Dawn, we've got two senior SpaceX engineers, uh, lead mission controller uh, or um, mission director. So oversees all of mission control, um, you know, in Anna Menon. I have the SpaceX lead astronaut trainer, trained every NASA crew that's gone into orbit to date in, um, in Sarah Gillis. Um, these are incredibly educated, talented engineers. So to, you know, be essentially prejudging any of that, their kind of capabilities based on a black flight suit versus a blue flight suit, I, I just think is short-sighted. It's missing the point, which is we should, we should focus on delivering Hubble for, for decades in the, into the future. And, and ideally, if we can do it at no cost, man, that's a, that's a touchdown for, uh, for scientists all over the world. So just to follow up on that, have you given any thought as to who would accompany you on the Hubble 
uh, mission, if you could tell us who that is. And then also, if you're not able to do the Hubble mission, if NASA comes back and says, you know what, this is should be done robotically or shouldn't be done uh, at all, have you? What what would your second flight be? Have you given any thought to that? How you would push the envelope then with that second flight? Yeah. Um, sorry, you got to remind me of the first part of the question. Oh, oh, and actually, now we got it. Yeah. Crew. So for me, thinking about crew uh, is just, uh, or even the name of the program is just now is not the appropriate time. We've got Polaris Dawn coming up, and to your point earlier, there are a lot of ambitious objectives associated with that. We've got to execute really well on Polaris Dawn, or, or there won't even be a second Polaris mission. So. That is the immediate focus now. There's a study going on. The study even has broader implications than just Hubble. I mean, the idea that you could use a proven vehicle like Dragon for, for servicing or other missions in low Earth orbit, even beyond Hubble, is just awesome. So let's just let them do their thing and, and get the, the study going. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's priority. And yeah, I think that's right. So. That's Fair, fair enough. You've talked a lot about sort of the, the, the broader scope, the context of all this, the commercial space sector, um, and you come from, from the business world. So I, I wonder, Jared, if you can talk a little bit about, will there be a self-sustaining space economy at some point, do you think? Because right now, you know, there's so much is reliant on NASA and on, on the government. But at what point do we get to that point where there is a self-sustaining space economy, you know, like, and people are doing more frequently the kinds of things that, that you're doing right now? Yeah, it's it's so incredible to think about. I'm, first of all, I'm 100% convinced there will be. I just can't exactly point to you in, in, in any one specific direction right now because it's so early days. I mean, literally, you know, for, for 60 years of, of hum, you know, human spaceflight history, the first time that you didn't have a, a world superpowers presence in orbit was just was just last year um, with with Inspiration Four going up. So that that was the first step uh, where it became you know slightly more affordable that you could you could open up space to to potentially commercial industry. Um, it still has obviously a long way to come down, but the thing is it it, it will. Um, you have a lot of competition right now. You have a lot of groundbreaking technology with rapidly reusable rockets, and that's going to progress into something like Starship. And from that point, when, you, when you're able to lower the cost to accelerate mass to orbit to such an extent that I think we're heading to, anything is possible. I mean, the, the, the best uh, you know, um, analogy I can make to this is uh, the early days of cell phones. I mean, it, it, it was it was on Wall Street that you had, uh, you know, the, the the rich guys with their car phones and it looked super obnoxious driving down the road. And now you've got like 13 year olds all over the world with cell phones and all sorts of apps. And it's completely I mean, you have how many billion dollar businesses right now, hundred billion dollar businesses that were created predominantly on mobile applications that nobody could have ever imagined in the 1980s when you had when you had car phones. And think about all the good it's done for the world right now. I mean, you, you've got unrest all over the world. You have real humanitarian crises. You have, you have natural disasters where people are capturing these things on their cell phones, making it available to the world. It's bringing help. It's bringing attention to some of these issues. It's probably saving lives. It's certainly saving lives. So where we are today is just the very beginning. It is like the very beginning of the second space age right now. And, and where we go 5, 10, 15 years from now, especially when you know, total game changing technology like Starship comes online is, is, is hard to predict, but it will be something. There's just too much we don't understand out there. We've really just begun in space. Like we've just touched our, our, a toe in the water um, of something that's like this many times the size of the ocean. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible when you think about it. Well, let's talk about Starship for a minute because I want to make sure our audience understands what Starship is. I mean, you're, we've got SpaceX flying the Falcon 9 and the Dragon that takes NASA's astronauts and, and private citizens like you uh, to orbit or the International Space Station. Starship is this next generation rocket that Elon Musk has been working on uh, for quite a while that would be fully reusable and uh, NASA has invested in it, awarding SpaceX a contract uh, to use Starship to land its astronauts on the moon. And Jared, you are going to be on the first human spaceflight mission uh, of Starship, which is which is amazing to think, but in, in some ways that maybe not so much. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about and what you think it represents? Sure. So, so to help explain it a little bit, um... Starship is uh, is bigger and has uh, twice as much thrust as, in its current form, and obviously will only get better 
as the Saturn V rocket that that landed human beings uh, on the moon, you know, 50 years ago. So um, think about that giant Saturn V that you know we've all probably seen some pictures or video of to ultimately put two human beings uh, on the moon. That entire rocket got thrown away. There, there wasn't a, a component of it that was really reu reused for any subsequent missions. Now you're talking about something that is much larger, it has twice as much thrust, and the whole thing is reusable, the entirety of it. The first stage booster and the actual Starship that's, that's on top of it itself can be reused. Uh, and instead of putting, you know, potentially two people on the moon, you know, the capacity of this thing could be, could be upwards of 100 people. The actual uh, nose potion, cone portion of Starship has more habitable volume in it than the entirety of the International Space Station that we've been building for the last 20 some odd years that probably was over $100 billion and, and I don't even know how many launches in order to assemble it. Um, now, if you if you look to even modern technology like Falcon and Dragon that, that that I wrote on, so the first stage booster, which it still blows all our minds today, comes back to Earth, lands on a ship, and then it makes like a you know one to two week journey, you know back to port, back to its refurbishment center before it potentially can be launched again. The second stage gets gets burned up in in um, in the atmosphere after it delivers its its payload or its Dragon capsule into orbit and then the dragon capsule will come back and after a couple months it can be refurbished and flown again now you compare that to starship where the first stage booster goes up and then it immediately comes back and lands on the launch pad so it doesn't have a multi-week uh transition from you know landing on a boat back to land to refurbishment and starship comes and it also essentially comes either right next to the launch pad or maybe someday gets caught by it as well so this cuts down the turnaround time for launches and its capacity uh, that it can bring in, in terms of mass to orbit is like orders of magnitude greater than what we're dealing with today. So that's fundamentally how you're going to bring costs down in a material way that could transform and ultimately create a space economy. But it's also what's going to put human beings back on, on the moon as uh, in the form of HLS, which NASA intends to use. And it's certainly going to be the vehicle that will, uh, or an iteration of it that will take humans to the first time to another planet, which would be Mars. So talking about that space economy, I mean, what do you think the biggest areas of growth are going to be when we have vehicles like Starship? Is it, you know, these constellations of satellites that we were talking about, like Starlink? Is it exploration? Is it mining celestial bodies? I mean, where, where do you, what, are, what interests you? Well, I think just the potential that it can do all of the above. Um, so, you know, you think about a... Um, you know, a, uh, the DART mission recently. So the, uh, you know, the space vehicle that essentially crashed into an asteroid to determine, um, you know, to learn from it as a pot potential defense mechanism for a future asteroid, uh, you know, impact in, or potential impact into Earth. And then I think about, well, what if you had, you know, essentially 500 starships because they're building factories in Texas and Florida to mass produce these things in a very like simple, reliable way. You wouldn't have to spend hundreds of millions or billions of dollars building one-offs of anything, a one-off, you know, asteroid interceptor, a one-off telescope, a one-off, you know, spaceship design. Like you literally could put a giant telescope in a starship. You could put, you know, a a, a system into a starship to attack a incoming asteroid. Um, it's like almost like a prefab, uh, low-cost, highly reusable uh, structure that can do almost anything in low Earth orbit. You want to put out, you know, a uh, hundred potential cube satellites that build a constellation that does something that makes Earth a better place, you totally can do it. I mean, you, you already have that now with uh, with Starlink, you know, over 3,000 satellites in low Earth orbit that is bringing connectivity um, to disconnected communities all over the world. I mean, you're not going to run fiber lines across rainforests and deserts, but you still got to bring access to information to, to these parts of the world. Starlink can do that in an incredibly low cost way. And when you connect the world, think of how many problems you can solve. You know, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is a, is a very important part of the Polaris program. Um, it goes right back to that focus of, of trying to, you know, solve problems here on earth while building a better future, you know, for a better future for tomorrow. You know, the childhood cancer survival rate in the U.S. has gone up, you know, threefold since St. Jude, um, you know, opened its doors 60 years ago. The rest of the world is not caught up. I mean, the number one factor in childhood cancer survival rates um, is, you know, where you're born in the world. Now, imagine with Starlink technology and you can connect some of these really remote places, you're going to find families that didn't even know they need the help of an organization like St. Jude in the form of telemedicine 
um, and you're going to raise childhood cancer survival rates around the world. That's just a start. There's education, right? I mean, it, this is foundational to solving a lot of the world's problems, and it's only achievable with rapid reusable uh, rocket technology that brings costs down. Now multiply that times, I don't know, 100 when Starship comes online. The world is going to be a better place. You just can't point your finger on exactly which one it will be. And, and now, like, space is cool again, right? I mean, SpaceX is doing its thing, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, flights like Inspiration4 and the Polaris mission. And one of the things you're seeing now is all of this money, this investment money, pouring into the space sector, which was considered not that long ago a very risky sector. I wonder what you make of that and all these companies that are going public through SPACs and all these startups that are popping up. How many of you, those do you think are actually going to make it? And is there enough of a market to support all of this? Well, I think uh, so. There's a lot of kind of things to address there. One, uh, I think space is cool again for some people. And, and I think that, um, you know, there's a very passionate part of the community that overlooks the, the benefits that that space can give us. I mean, overlooks the fact that a lot of what we know about climate change and natural disasters come from, from a assets we have in space. A lot of the reasons we're able to avoid conflict in the world is based on information that we can gather from space and information we can transmit from it. Um, but despite all that, there's, I think, definitely a portion of the population that um, believes that, you know, we, we have to stop the world from burning today and that any bit of time or energy or resources we spend in space comes at the consequence of, you know, uh, rainforests being destroyed or, um, you know, or other, you know, uh, you know, horrific circumstances that we have on our planet we have to address. And I wish more people would look at it as um, you can do both. You can, you can, you can always, you always should strive for progress uh, to make the world better for tomorrow. And we have the resources and means to try and address some of the problems we have here today. Um, so I think space is cool again for some. I wish it was more for others that could, um, you know, could look at both sides of the argument a little bit and find uh, a compromise. But hey, we've, we've got that problem through a number of uh, uh, issues in society. In terms of like uh, the money that's flowed into the space industry, look, it, we're, we, we've just come off, you know, 15 years of a near zero interest rate environment uh, that encouraged risk taking. And a lot of industries and a lot of companies were formed um, that in more challenging times would, would never have been able to survive. That's not exclusive to space. Uh, but for sure, the space industry received a lot of capital and, and I definitely am concerned they, they won't continue to receive it. Um, you know, you have a lot of businesses that are trying to solve problems that other organizations can do at affordable rates uh, and they're losing a lot of money on the way. So that's not to say that, that the world will just be SpaceX. I don't think that's the case. I think there's a couple really good space companies that have been smart on their capital allocation. They bought other businesses. They've diversified revenue streams. They're more vertically integrated. I think they'll succeed. But, but a lot will, will, will go away, just like I think across tech and in and, and, and other industries, you're going to see a lot of business failures as interest rates now are, you know, essentially going through the roof. And, um, you know, and, and in that environment, just, you know, you have to pick your battles on where you deploy capital from like an investor's perspective. And, um, and the bar is very, very high right now. Um, and, and I think a lot of the space industry won't be able to, to, to cut it. Yeah, for sure. So we're almost running out of time. Last question, a prediction question. And, and often I get asked this question and people say, what do you think is going to happen in space 40 or 50 years from now, which is sort of pointless. Let's narrow the horizon 10 years out. What's, what's realistic? What's feasible from your point of view? Well, I think you'll, you, you know, you won't be measuring the number of people in, in orbit at one time in the single digits um, or even the double digits. I think you'll have hundreds, if not thousands of people, um, at least in low Earth orbit um, and probably lunar orbit within 10 years. But I, I also think you have human beings walking on Mars. And um, I don't know if people really appreciate it. I mean, the, the, you know, if you can get to the moon, which we will certainly do, and Starship is definitely capable of doing it, the amount of additional velocity to get to Mars um, is, is negligible. I mean, at that point, it's, a, it's about habitability for a six to nine month journey, and it's, a, it's about a, a means of getting back home. Uh, and I don't think these are you know, um, obstacles that can't be overcome. So my prediction, you, you've got hundreds at the same time, if not a thousand or so people that are in low Earth orbit, lunar orbit within 10 years. Um, and I think you, you definitely have people uh, you know, walking around on, on Mars. And that, that's pretty exciting. And I think, uh, I think Starlink will probably be the, the driving, or I'm sorry, uh, SpaceX will be the, the leading organization in making it possible. And Starship is probably the vehicle that's doing it. 
Well, that'll certainly give uh, me and all my fellow space reporters a lot to write about, so, so thanks. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Uh, Jared Isaacman, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for, for joining us. Uh, to check out all of the interviews that are coming up and uh, information on all the programs, please log in and register at WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Christian Davenport. Thanks so much for joining us.